Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everybody. William Harris here, founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast, where I feature experts in the direct-to-consumer industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. And uh, today, my uh, guest is Matt Barr. Uh, I have him here. He is the co-founder and CEO of Fairing, Shopify's leading post-purchase survey tool. Having spent a decade in e-com helping brands with attribution and analytics, his product, Question Stream, uses direct from consumer data at speed and scale to enrich attribution and customer journeys. We also apparently both share love for chess and the ever so controversial decaf coffee. But before we dig in, I do want to thank our sponsor. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million. Uh, and we were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. So uh, now let's get past the boring stuff and into the fun stuff. I've got Matt here. Matt, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. This is great. Excited to dive into it. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I kind of wanted to start with, which is what I think you and I both share a love for, uh, comes down to attribution, uh, which is obviously the whole reason why you guys exist is a lot of the attribution side of things. Um, and I feel like attribution is a very messy thing. It's a topic that's gotten a lot of uh, controversy over the last couple of years. Um, ever since iOS 14 uh, came out, 14.5, ITP 2.3, there's all these things that kind of really got in the way of attribution. Um, and we did a study, I know personally, uh, at Element, where we used uh, Faring and your data there on a couple of clients of ours. Um, and Grace Peach, actually, on our team is the one who did this. Uh, and I want to make sure that I, I pull up the actual numbers here that she had. But, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere around um, yeah, like 600,000 orders that we ran through here. 78% of the conversions were credited uh, that were misattributed based on what people actually, what, what UTMs were taking credit for versus what people actually said. And when we looked at this for Facebook and Instagram specifically, this is what really stood out uh, to us. Uh, from the responses where people said, I came to this store and made this purchase because of a Facebook and Instagram ad, 98.15% of those were actually tied to a UTM of direct. Uh, and I think that's one of those things where people really are are misunderstanding where their data is coming from and where uh, things are coming from from the purchase side of things um, without understanding and having this type of data at, at play it makes it hard for them to make decisions. So why why did you start faring? Is this the problem that you're trying to solve? What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, that was that was the exact problem that we were trying to solve. So we we launched faring in what, May 2018. Um, so coming up on five years, frankly, um, very much just a side project for the first three and a half or so. Uh, and the initial use case was exactly that. So I think when when brands really try to solve attribution or when it, when it starts to hit home is when they start to diversify, frankly, out of kind of Facebook and, and Instagram and into other channels. And then they look at GA or they look at kind of anything that might lean a little bit heavy on the, the last click side of things. And then you just immediately know either their campaigns are not working like at all, or they're having a trouble on the measurement side. Um, so we got we built kind of V1 of fairing uh, for a brand here in New York City called Kara that was like doing all these influencer campaigns uh, and frankly was seeing zero success in Google Analytics. It was all direct. Um, so they were seeing some some revenue come through, but they had no idea where it was coming from. And we suggested to them, we were actually building a totally different product at the time. Uh, in the same day delivery space, uh, something we could also talk about, but we don't bring up too often. Uh, and we suggested to them, uh, just go at a Google form. Like uh, at the time there was a different app on Shopify that allowed you to easily drop HTML onto the order confirmation page. So they downloaded that, created a Google form, spun up a simple attribution question, like how did you hear about us? Uh, and started capturing data. And the cool part about it is like, it took, I don't know, an hour to set up. Um, and they were like instantly glued to the data. Um, super insightful. All of those influencers' names were coming through now. So they had all this exposure into what they weren't seeing before. Uh, and then funny enough, somebody, the thing that triggered it is somebody wrote in. They were like, hey, I met Aaron at a party last week. Uh, and the CEO, Aaron, was like, like, who wrote this? I want to go thank them. Uh, and 
we're like, well, we have no idea. Like it lives as it lives on an iframe. It's not connected to the order. So there's really the only thing we have is a timestamp. So we can like kind of guess, but that's about it. And that's really where the idea of like can a simple survey solution exist that simply ties order information together with uh, survey response data. So that was a little bit about how we got started. And then it uh, was just a side project. We were like kind of moving to consulting, trying to find product market fit with our other products. Uh, and then things really started to pick up in early 2020 uh, with COVID, e-commerce grew, as well as iOS 14 and kind of everything that happened from a tracking perspective. So that's kind of been our journey as far as solving a very simple problem and now continuing to scale from a product perspective. I love the idea of solving a very simple problem. And just the, the very simple fact of this, one of the things that I talk about when it comes to attribution all the times is uh, if you are driving a car uh, and your speedometer is broken, let's say that's your attribution, uh, you could be driving down the road. And if you push the gas, you go faster. You can you can look out the window and tell that you're going faster. Like that's the simple solution to to one of these problems. And one of the most simple things you can do uh, from an e-commerce perspective is just ask people, right? If you're not sure where they came from, how about just ask them, well, hey, where did you come from? Where, what brought you to the site yeah. today to make this purchase? Um, yeah. Exactly. You you guys went through a rebrand recently, uh, formerly uh, Inquire, right? Uh, yeah. And rebranded as Faring. Tell me a little bit about like, what was the thought process? Like, has the product changed in a way that made you say like, we need to do something different to kind of say who we are? Yeah, there were, there were a few reasons. The first kind of more important is like, we never really had a brand around Inquire. Um, it was literally, I turned to my co-founder, our CTO, and I was just, how does Inquire sound? Good change the name. Like that was literally the first iteration of it. Um, again, Enquire now fairing was really always just meant to be, we joking like, Oh, it'd be cool if this generated 5k a month and like paid for some beers and helped fund under other ideas was really the initial thought. Um, and then last year, like we raised a seed round in December, 2021. Um, so had a little bit more capital and the product and kind of the vision started to expand. So, uh, we introduced this kind of core feature called question stream, which is, uh, kind of allows you to, to dynamically ask questions. We've almost removed the concept of a survey. We, we think surveys are somewhat antiquated. They're these monoliths, kind of jokingly call them interrogations. Uh, and with that, coupled with the fact that like Enquire didn't really have a brand, like we had colors, but that was about it. We're like, okay, let's go through this process and kind of reinvent the company from a brand perspective. And where we landed with Faring, we went through about 20 different names. We really did a lot of the exercise internally, so we didn't really outsource any of that. Um, and frankly, fairing was the one that stuck the most. Uh, there's some really cool kind of metaphors into uh, kind of aerodynamics. A fairing is essentially anything that's added to a surface to make it more aerodynamic. Um, and we view uh, what we're doing similar on the digital surface. Um, and having like just like a car nut and like into things that go fast myself, it was like this beautiful brand. Um, and frankly, we could own a lot of the domains that we acquired, like fairing.co is kind of our core domain. Um, we were actually just able to buy it. Um, so from a surface area, there's always, you find this perfect name and like literally there's a SaaS company called that perfect name. Um, so we were super excited that no one had kind of taken the fairing name yet. So we have some really cool things coming um, later this year, early next, that'll really lean into the brand uh, a little bit further, whether from a product perspective, but even just go to market. Yeah, naming and finding something that hasn't been taken by a SaaS company. Very true. That is a, a difficult thing. I know I've used some random name generators for uh, some things <laughs> that I've tried to do too. And it's like, you end up with just absolutely ridiculous ideas. And so you nailed a good one with fairing. And I, I didn't realize that about uh, the reason behind it and, and the, uh, the aerodynamics of it. But that makes a lot of sense. Because like you said, there's a lot of friction sometimes to that growth. And it's like, well, how do you speed up that growth? You have to reduce that friction. And and one of those is reducing the friction to understanding where your data is coming from. So I that that makes a lot of sense. I like that. Yeah, um, yeah, we're super super excited about it. You you had mentioned to me when we talked before uh, about uh, like this this big milestone, like this turning point for you guys um, about uh, hiring and and going from two people to fourteen people, and you know should have hired this person. Tell me a little bit about that. Cause I feel like that's a struggle that everybody can relate to, whether you're a SaaS company, an e-commerce company or whatever, but we all are going from, you know, zero to two to 14 people. Yeah. So we were, we were just a two person company for, for a long time. And most of our product decisions were just 
a lot of it wasn't even documented. They were just in-person conversations. We've, Kurt and I have always been kind of very in-person people. I'm um, like, I'm at our office now in New York. Um, so a lot of those decisions were kind of made in our little bubble because that was the only bubble that existed. So post raising our seed round, we kind of had to think about changing those things. And it definitely took longer than we thought. Um, our Funny enough, our first PM started this morning, um, which we're super excited about to help us kind of Congrats. organize and ship faster into all kind of the exciting things on the product side of things. So definitely a little bit of a journey of like, okay, how do we go from two to five to 10? Um, we're still very like heavy engineering oriented from a team perspective, not leaning too much into go to market, um, really just to make sure that we nail the product right before we do that. Um, but definitely been somewhat of a journey and like reflecting on, uh, what is slowing us down? Um, and I think a lot of founders out there like ourselves, like the thing that's slowing you down is typically like yourself, like you almost end up being the bottleneck or you're not trusting someone to do something, which maybe not might not be the right hire kind of thing. So yeah. those are the things that we've had to learn um, that I think we're in a really good place now, but it definitely took us a little bit to get there. Are you familiar with EOS Traction, uh, Gino Wickman? That I've Bell heard of it. I'm not too familiar with it. One of the concepts that they talk about that I really appreciate is, you know, the idea of if you were in a, a boat, let's say that we're you know, in a rowboat and uh, let's say you've got two people in that boat. It's, it's fairly easy for those two people to row kind of like uh, in sync with each other and row in the same direction. Uh, but you get, you know, six, seven, ten people. The, the more you get, it's like you might get out of sync and there's a lot of inefficiency there. Maybe somebody's rowing in the wrong direction and you're you're fighting each other a little bit. And I, yeah, I think that one of the things that I've appreciated in my own journey of going from, you know, uh, solopreneur to to uh, I think we're at 13 employees now. Uh, not I think I know we're at 13. Uh, and but one of the things that that I found is is just that communication piece of, like you said, being able to say, how do I get myself out of being a bottleneck and being able to communicate? What is our what's our vision? What are our uh, values and how can those things empower my team to be able to make decisions? Um, what have you found has been the biggest challenge in you being able to become not the bottleneck in fairing? Yeah, I think for us, it's just hiring the right people. Like that's definitely what we're focused on now. And um, that's the easiest unlock for I think anyone is is hiring people that you can delegate to. Um, so that's definitely been a learning for us. And like the communication side is interesting because like everyone knows, I feel like you need to over communicate, you need to kind of reiterate these things. But putting that into sure. practice, like takes time, um, like setting aside time, which like I definitely could get better on. Um, even from an all like our all hands on Monday morning, it's like, OK, well, let's start preparing the deck for the all hands the week before. And like, how do we get into more of a system where like, I'm doing a much better job now, just blocking off my calendar, like Thursday mornings until noon are essentially white space where nothing can be scheduled. Over. Um, so just starting to do those things and not over committing has been helpful where it's, Hey, let's do a, a white space Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's like, well, that inevitably is going to get taken over with meetings and whatnot. So that's been super helpful. Um, we also just hired our first kind of VA um, who's been super helpful just from an email perspective and doing some kind of BPO, like business ops types things um, has been super helpful. So we're starting, we're still in the process of doing it, uh, but definitely on our way, which is, which is more exciting. It's kind of the one thing people ask me all the time is like, how do we feel post raising a four and a half million dollar seed like about that decision? Um, and yeah. The thing that was most excited for Kurt and I, outside of like understanding like the TAM is much larger than we thought and the product was kind of had all these opportunities to it, was like we got to almost reinvent what our day to day looked like um, from, hey, just being two person, two people using kind of consultants and kind of doing that to actually scaling a team. And we've both done that before in our previous sure. previous roles. And that was kind of the, the thing that we were most excited from a org perspective is transitioning from being rewarded for like frugalness say, uh, to being rewarded for ambition, which also meant we got to hire the best people. Um, and it was no longer a function of, of what can we afford, but more or less like who are the people that we want to bring onto the team. I think that's cute, key because you have to have intentionality about who you're hiring, right? I think sometimes it's very easy to just want to fill a spot with a body because you're busy and you're, you're stressed out and frustrated. Um, and you mentioned hiring the right people too. And it's like, you can't just put just anybody into that spot. Um, one of the things that I like to do, I have a question that I like to ask, um, and I'm, I'm going to give it away now, I guess, so I, I won't be able to uh, maybe use this one uh, as much anymore going forward. But um, 
I like to ask questions that I know necessarily don't have immediately easily solvable answers. Um, and one of the questions I ask is from, a, I believe it's called the Titan test. Uh, and it's a, an IQ test for trying to test specificity above 150 IQs. Um, and it says, if uh, consider the, the torus uh, and you're going to slice this torus uh, along uh, two Mobius strips, how many pieces would you have? What are the most number of pieces that you could have by doing this? I don't expect anybody to get this right. I don't even know that I would get it right. But the idea here is I just want to see what the thought process is. It's like you're going to run into challenges uh, in your job and whatever that is. Do you have what are your what's your thought process like to be able to solve those types of problems? Is there a question that you find yourself enjoying asking people to figure out if you're ask, if you're hiring the right people or not? In our hiring process, I think what we've sussed out, which has been helpful, is just finding people that have a more so like a startup mentality, whether it's like we don't have to call it a founder mentality, but more or less like someone who understands the just general chaos that might go on from a startup perspective and how sure. things can change and whatnot. Um, as far as one question to ask, we, we certainly don't utilize, we don't have kind of, and we, I think you and I spoke about Occam's razor in the sense of like, how do we remove yep. all the variables and just focus on one thing? Um, we haven't fine tuned that yet. Like, I think we're still learning from a hiring perspective, frankly. Um, it's really the honest truth here. Um, we're definitely getting better with each hire as we do that. Um, what we over index for is like really curiosity, frankly, um, of like curious like about solving a problem, curious literally about anything. Almost. Like, um, if someone likes to go super deep into something, they're typically innately curious. So during our interview process, we try to understand kind of like we hired an incredible designer about two months ago. And it was like very, very clear that she was just could talk about design all day, every day, like didn't want to talk about anything yeah. else. I was like, this is someone that I want on our team because they're now she's now our lead product designer and all of these design decisions are going to be hers. So if we're able to kind of over index for that, that that allows us to kind of solve these problems. So. Absolutely. Not the best yeah, answer yeah. in the sense. There's no singular truth yet um, from a hiring perspective, but um, that's how we no, at least think about it. But I think we've all seen those charts where you you look at like, you know, people's talent versus their desire and desire almost always outperforms talent uh, given a long enough runway. Um, and so that idea of that curiosity and that desire uh, being at the core of what you guys are doing, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I was looking at the weather here in Sutter, it's uh, 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is beautiful. Finally, a little bit melting here. Uh, Humidity is at 36%. We've got pressure of 29.62. Visibility is at 10 miles. Wind at 14 miles per hour. Dew points at 50 degrees. UV index 5 out of 10. Um, and so I was thinking about that and wondering, you know, what kind of a pitfall or uh, mistake uh, have, do you have that you would want to talk about? Um, one of the things that we talked about was, you know, maybe this blog post that you'd written or um, raising money from friends and family. There's, there's many things that we as founders uh, go through uh, and we say, oh boy, that was a tough thing to deal with. Is there one that you feel comfortable chatting about? Yeah, I think for us, uh, somewhat related to fairing, but like not having product, like I, everyone talks about product market fit um, and our previous product, like I quit, uh, I was a merchant for the first half of my career. I quit that side of the business because at the time I was literally so enamored with same day delivery. Um, so I don't know if you remember, but Uber Rush, Postmates, they all these APIs, you literally like hit an endpoint and then someone shows up. Like it was the coolest thing to me. And uh, I was working for this headphone company at the time, kind of running funny enough, like I was head of digital and logistics, which still is funny to think about, um, but was also managing the site. So we built this awesome front end experience and we integrated with Postmates and Uber um, and at the time, just like, this is the future of commerce, um, just kind of young and naive, not a lot of experience kind of on, or, or I was managing the PL, but I wasn't thinking about the PL as I was kind of wanting to build a new business. Um, and kind of the hardest thing for us really was like, we didn't understand that we didn't have product market fit. We thought that the, if we just kind of kept iterating a little, we'd get there. Um, and it was about like 15 or so months of like continuing to push and sell. And my fortunate enough, my like entry was always like, Hey, let's grab coffee. I was in New York and like, and I get intros to people like, let's chat about kind of e-com and if I could help maybe as like a side consultant. And then I'd kind of pitch the same day thing. Um, that's kind of how we grew up, uh, 
faring as well early on. And I think the the hardest thing that we had to is like, okay, we raised, we did raise some friends and family, not a ton, about 75, 80 grand. And since we had done that, there was no like a year in or at least the social pressures, there was no like, okay, we don't have product market fit. We have 10K left of the, of the capital we raised, time to go get different jobs. Um, and I think one of the things that founders don't often talk about is like, once you raise a little bit of money, like you can't just quit. Like there's too much social pressure. There's too many people depending on you, yeah. whether it's employees or, or investors that you can actually kind of shut the door. And you hear all the time, like people are so resilient, like this person never gives up, but they don't talk about it. It's like, you're almost like forced to not give up for certain things, especially as you sure. raise more and more capital. There is no like, I'm gonna give my resignation tomorrow and give two weeks and walk away. <laughs> um, so I think for us, it was, we as we were pivoting out of the same day delivery, and it was like a, it was a marketplace and it was a B2B SaaS and kind of never, like, frankly, never found product market fit. We were just going to move into consulting, um, which in New York, now I'm not sure how the market is now. At the time, there was just so many consulting opportunities within e -com, And we were just going to build maybe a consulting business for a couple of years, pay our kind of friends and family back and then move on. Um, and funny enough, that's how this was born in the sense of, oh, we were, consul we were transitioning to consulting. A customer had a problem. Can we build a solution? Like I had was sitting next to a very senior engineer all day kind of thing. So I think as far as like challenge goes, it's kind of the path to product market fit. And one of the biggest things that I know now is like what product market fit feels like, which is some semblance of word of mouth and kind of growth without kind of leaning into growth versus I think we had like 15 customers on the same day thing. And like we had to hustle to get all 15 and they were paying us like $200 a month. Yes. Um, so that that's kind of the path. That's like one thing that if I can iterate anyone that's starting a company of just like understanding product market fit and trying to get some semblance or validation of that before going kind of much, much deeper. Um, and whether it's experiments, like everyone, like it's a lot of like, which sound great on purpose on paper, which is like do micro experiments, but it's like, that's very hard to execute kind of thing. You almost have to like lean in and then lean in and then lean in kind of thing. So that was probably the hardest time for us of just like, what are we doing? We can't quit. What does the future look like? Kind of thing. So that's kind of what I like to harp on the most. I think you talked about a couple of things that I really like there. One, you know, is the pressure uh, that we inevitably feel as uh, entrepreneurs and owners. And uh, I know I felt it personally. And there was a video I saw of, of Elon Musk talking about how um, at a certain point, the job of a CEO, your job is for all of the worst problems in the company to bubble their way up to you. <laughs> um, you know, if, if it's solved by somebody else, then it doesn't make its way to you. But it's like you get all of the problems that, you know, eventually make their way to you. And, and it's that is that is your job to a point to solving all of the biggest problems in the company and, or, or, or sometimes these very challenging things. And and it can feel sometimes very overwhelming uh, because you're oftentimes also solving things you haven't solved before. They, these are new things to you and having a, a team of people behind you to help uh, with that and, and uh, mentors and stuff like that. Um, but the other thing you talked about, though, that I really like is product market fit. And I feel like that's something that um, maybe doesn't get evaluated often enough in businesses. And so let's say, you know, maybe year one, two, three, you've got great product market fit and then things change. Uh, and all of a sudden uh, the market has shifted and maybe uh, companies don't uh, keep up with what that is. Uh, you, and you mentioned it, for you, a lot of this came down to almost, you know, word of mouth growth where it, it didn't seem so hard. Uh, any other tips or tricks that you could think of for how somebody can identify if they're maybe, maybe they're doing the ads stuff that they're doing and they're doing all these other things to grow. They're not growing the way they want. Are there red flags that you've seen, at least in your own journey to where you're saying, maybe, maybe my problem is product market fit and I need to rethink this. And I had product market fit, but I need to, to look at this differently. Like are there red flags or things that you look at for that? Yeah, I think it, it depends on if we're talking software, if we're talking consumer kind of the vertical is important here too but also that sure. we were growing so fast early on too because we were essentially the only player in the market like vocally talking about these things like um like attribution surveys i think i own attribution surveys we own direct from consumer.com we own a bunch of urls because no one was talking about these things um so i think the combination of not a ton of competition coupled with uh an existing problem solved in a new way like allowed us to kind of go very deep in those things. I think from, from a product perspective to us, we're, we're super excited to go wider from a product um, 
from a product kind of feature perspective in the sense of like, how do we solve other problems in combination with attribution by using direct from consumer data? Um, so that's kind of the path we're taking. We could have definitely chosen, and a lot of people still tell us to just go deeper into attribution. Um, but frankly, that space is already very crowded. We've partnered with the best in that space. So like, let us get really good at ingesting the data and allow them to solve kind of more of the intricacies of those things, whether we're talking about MTA or media mix modeling, whatever we want to talk about on that side of things, um, and us to go a little bit wider. So from a market perspective, like we're we're excited because the market for asking consumers questions, frankly, is very validated. Like Qualtrics just got, again, repurchased for over $10 billion. Sure. So like this market is there and it's not like arguably going to go away. Um, there's definitely some really cool things happening with technology as everyone is seeing, but at the end of the day, like those things even need inputs and consumers are going to be a lot of those. Inputs. So that's kind of what we're most excited about is like, how do we rethink how data is collected? Um, kind of push out the idea of surveys and these interrogations uh, and rethink uh, kind of direct from consumer and how the consumer is part of the conversation where all the hype was around voice of customer, maybe five, 10 years ago, um, which is funny. Sure. Like you don't hear that very often in uh, at least in the direct from consumer or direct to consumer space, because it was almost wasn't important. Like Facebook was most important and optimizing Facebook was most important. Um, and getting feedback wasn't because Facebook was going to find those kind of little pockets of customers that kind of fit your value prop perfectly. Um, and as that gets more difficult, as we're seeing voice of customer, direct from consumer, whatever we want to call it, uh, is going to, we think, going to be a very important vertical in the stack for everyone. Sure. So, okay, let's run with this a little bit, because this is something that you seem pretty excited and passionate about and what you have a vision for. Um, what do you see as the future of customer data? Like you said, it's like not interrogations, but it's like, where, where are we going? What is the, what is the plan in the, you know, the future look like for this? Yeah, our, our North Star from a product perspective is asking the right question at the right time. Um, and the rules like that is obviously quite nebulous. Like, what does that mean? Uh, and sure. the rules can be determined by a lot of factors. It could just be optimizing for more data capture, for example, which is something we'd probably not encourage because you're start, going to start to get kind of noisy data in that sense. Or it could be, hey, I'm trying to solve attribution. So it's like, we already know X, Y, Z about Matt from an attribution sense. Like, let's ask him a different question that's going to solve this other business problem. Um, so it's starting to, how do we kind of do more with less, really how we think about it. Um, and we don't necessarily have to ask every customer 10, 20 questions. We can ask this customer, these three questions, these customer, these four questions. And our, our question stream product was, this, I don't want to say initially built for this, <laughs> uh, but it's very much built in a way that allows questions to almost live on multiple different surfaces at different times. Um, so it's going to allow us to get really intelligent around when we ask questions. So that, that's kind of what we're most excited about and where we see the space going instead of like hitting send, a bulk send for everyone gets the same series of questions from this maybe NPS survey. It's like, hey, you and I maybe get the first same question and then every question thereafter sure. is kind of optimized for a particular reason. No, that makes a lot of sense. The right question at the right time to the right person, right? Um, and, uh, it, it just reminds me of questions in general. Uh, I, my dad's an engineer and I believe you, when we talked you, come from an engineering, uh, background fa family as well. Um, and I know one of the things that my dad has always said is, you know, the five whys. And I don't know if you're familiar with the five whys. Is that a thing that you heard growing up at all? I haven't. No. <laughs> okay. So the five whys that he would always tell me, uh, was, uh, you, you just, you have to ask five, why five times to get to the root of whatever the problem is or something Got along it. those lines. And, you know, it's like, okay, I ran out of gas in the car. Well, why? Well, uh, because I didn't, uh, the, the gas gauge was broken. So I, I didn't know that it was empty. Well, why is the gas gauge broken? Well, I didn't have the money to fix the gas gauge. Okay. Well, why didn't you have the money to fix the gas gauge? Well, because I got laid off or whatever. And so you get to this, it's like, okay, so here's the actual root of the problem of, of what happened. Right. And now we can actually start solving the problem that needs to be solved. And yeah. just that idea of asking questions in general, I think is key. And I think a lot of us aren't even asking those questions at all of our customers. And I think that's a big breakdown, but then if you can go beyond that to just like you said, moving past interrogations, but asking the right question at the right time to the right person, you're going to get even better answers. So I, I really like where you went with that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely, we talk a lot about first principles, which it seems like is very similar uh, to the five whys. In the sense of, like from a first principle standpoint, like what are we actually trying to solve? Like 
if, if it's attribution, like why, you know what I mean? So we talk about a lot of that internally. Um, the five whys is probably a little bit easier way to get to the first principle essentially. Yeah. But if you've got people that understand what you're trying to accomplish, then I think that makes sense. It's probably a le- less efficient way of getting there. Uh, but it's a good way to start training people to practice how to think that way. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned the idea of like this serendipity. I remember you were talking about just a little bit ago here um, and you hinted at this of like this almost like happy accident. You're solving this problem for a customer. Um, it, there was a little bit more to that story that I remember you told me before uh, with Elixir and everything else like that, too. Um, and the reason why I want to bring this up is, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into it in a second here, but can, can you tell me that story again? Like how this actually ended up happening in like that serendipitous moment? Yeah, yeah. I think when we were chatting before, it was really... Uh, my first job in New York, funny enough, it was uh, cold call sales for Yext, uh, which went public like three or four years ago. Um, I lasted, I think, four weeks, five weeks. Like, and <laughs> funny enough, I was like the first, uh, not to go too much into these, I was like the number one sales guy on day one. And then I don't think I got it. I think I got one sale on day two, and then I didn't get another sale for like four weeks. Um, so just definitely not a cold, a cold call guy innately um but one thing that (laughs) i think jesse who i just reconnected with he's at this really cool company called rome now that we use at fairing uh he would often harp i think it was him would harp on like creating your own luck it's almost like Mm -hmm. creating your own serendipity Mm -hmm. um and that that's definitely something that's stuck with me it's almost just like as as a founder i obviously want to optimize my time but it's like well what if i stay a little bit later and go to this meeting like is there is there almost like serendipity or luck that could occur maybe down the road. And the story we spoke about before is I literally turned to Kurt, my co-founder, our CTO. It was like March. I could probably look it up from the first Git commit. It was like middle of March, 2018. And I was like, how about how easy would it, which is probably how I start most conversations, uh, be to build a simple post-purchase survey that tied order data together. And it didn't require like any convincing. Which like I'm sure I had a dozen ideas before this, and it was sure. just like Matt, shut up, like get back to work, kind of thing. Um, but the exciting thing is, and what you were alluding to before, is Kurt, who's been an engineer for 15, 20 years, just spent winter break, like that time between Christmas and New Year, learning Elixir, um, which is a language that's out of Erlang. Erlang is what WhatsApp was built in. Elixir is what like Discord is built in. It's typically for messaging. Um, mm-hmm. Funny enough, I think in an, Earnings reported like years ago, Goldman said, like Goldman Sachs said, like Erlang is literally part of their competitive advantage because their speed is so like they're literally gaining milli- like a millisecond more than a competitor, which allows them to optimize certain things. So Kurt was just learning that language, kind of really just looking into functional languages um, after having spent years uh, kind of working with Node. And the idea of serving questions, like there's a ton of similarity with like WhatsApp or messages in general. Like Erlang was initially built, I think by AT&T in the eighties for telecommunications. And there was this like perfect synergy. And I think he was like secretly looking for a project to look, kind of deepen his knowledge on Elixir. Um, mm-hmm. So funny enough, fast forward, he's like obviously very senior writing Elixir code now, but at the time when the first prototype of bearing was bill it was like the first time that he was actually writing anything that someone would use i think he wrote a small application to control his like sono system at his as at his folks house um initially and that was like i think possibly if he didn't uh have learned elixir a couple months before and like saw this great synergy he might not have like said yes so quickly and maybe i would have convinced him a week later or a couple days later but we don't know um so i think that that's what i was alluding to like it was like this perfect like marriage of he learned a new language we were moving a lot to consulting uh because we didn't have product market fit all that happened at the same time um and hey this product was born that quite frankly like i think within the first month we had like five or six shopify plus merchants which in 2018 was like something you really had to hustle for and it was like oh this is a very different go-to-market than our same day product um so yeah serendipity is so important like timing is literally i think a uh, derivative of serendipity almost. The reason why I love this story is because, again, going back to you and I both love chess. Um, and the, one of my favorite things about chess is that, uh, unlike with poker, there's no secret, right? Like 
I know everything that's out there. I know every possible move that you have in theory. Like I can see it all right there. Like I already know. Um, and so from a logic perspective, it becomes very, let's say, potentially easier to really understand the different moves that are out there. Now, I'm, I'm by no means, you know, Magnus Carlsen or anything like that, but it becomes easy to be able to compete uh, in, in a sport like that because you can you see all the options and the variables and whatever. Um, but what you can't see uh, in business that I think maybe equates it very similar to uh, poker in that way is like there's a lot of hidden things that you just don't know what are around the corner or, or even what the possibilities are. Um, and the idea of creating your own uh, your own luck there, as you would say it, where it's like it was based on a couple of key things that you already called out before curiosity. Well, your partner was curious, curious enough that he's, you know, in his free time going to read this other language. You guys are considering continuing to pursue these things. And so there's this idea of like perseverance, um, curiosity, and, and it melds together into exactly what you say. It's like this this perfect opportunity. Um, and you just have to be ready to strike it when it happens. But I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that it was it was years of being and emulating those qualities that led to that one idea being right at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. There's ton, there's a ton of business uh, like metaphors to to chess, which we could, which we could also get into. But it, it reminds me, I listened to the a podcast with the C, or one of the co-founders, Peter of Segment, and his story is like it's funny in the sense of they were building a very different product for the classroom, which is essentially this polling mm. product for the classroom. They built uh, analytics.js, which is kind of their JavaScript snippet to kind of track all these analytics and. He was essentially in this like no product market fit period. And one of his co-founders was like, let's like do this analytics.js thing. It's totally different than what we're doing. And in this interview, he was just like, I spent 24 hours, like literally thinking of every possible way for me to shut this down. Like I thought this was the worst idea. And I finally <laughs> was like, okay, perfect. We'll post it on Hacker News. And like, if it doesn't get more than like five votes, like we're shutting it down. This is the perfect plan to kind of, I don't want to be a jerk and kind of just shut it down. Uh, funny enough, it like had, I think, like 20,000 people on the wait list within like a month kind of thing. So Crazy. it's just funny in the sense of like, you have to be ready for anything kind of thing. And like something that you built, hey, analytics.js could actually turn into your products. The same story with Slack, where you just have to yeah. be willing and curious and almost listening to see what's going to work and what the market is is wanting. No, that's that's really good. Um, it reminds me of... Uh, uh, well, okay. The Slack story. Cause, cause, yes. C can you take me through that a little bit more? Cause I don't know if everybody who's listening knows that story, but I, I do think that's a good one to touch on as well. Yeah, they were, they were building, uh, essentially, uh, what were they? They were in the gaming vertical. Um, I think building a game, uh, and they built an internal tool to communicate, um, which essentially turned out to be Slack. Uh, raised a bunch of money for kind of the the video game product that they had never found product market fit was running out of cash and kind of like at a whim or like well we really like this internal tool what if we turn this into a product yep. um and like i'm sure no one maybe i'm sure but no one probably was like this is going to be what we built in the future it was more or less like we're just trying to solve a simple problem internally and obviously everyone has that problem um so that's what we're about to dog food our product. I think it's going to go live tomorrow um, where we're going to use nice. question stream in our onboarding flow, uh, which we're super excited about because it'll allow us to almost get a very different, like I have a, a, a merchant background, but it'll, it'll give us a very different kind of cadence or feeling of actually using the tool, mm -hmm. um, which I think is super important. Yeah. Um, you, you were talking about this earlier too, and, I, and I, I'm going to switch up topics just a little bit, but the idea of, let's say that when you get into those moments, those funks where you're just like, okay, we don't have product market fit um, and uh, maybe feeling the pressure. Uh, and so you're trying to figure out what that is and, and you're going through these processes, but you might be feeling frustrated or or overwhelmed or, or these other feelings of entrepreneurship. Um, and I found that for me, uh, there are certain things within my routine that help me to get out of those funks. Um, uh, there's even, you know, some some songs that I like to listen to that it's like, okay, just like reset my mind uh, on on what I would say is truth. I believe yeah, there's a, 
a Bible verse that says, you know, the truth will set you free. And for me, the idea of just truth in general sets you free from all of those other problems, not just, you know, salvation, but truth sets you free from, from worry, anxiety, guilt, and all these other things we could reframe your mind and say, wait, but is that true? Or am I just thinking this incorrectly? Um, what kind of a routine or things do you do when you're in those moments and you're saying, I kind of feel like I'm a little bit in a funk and I need to get out of this funk. How do you approach that? Yeah, I like I'm I can very easily tell when I'm in a funk, which is good. Like my sleep, I don't want to get out of bed. Like funny enough, I'm someone that like gets up usually around six and just my brain starts running. Um, and if I'm like in bed till like six forty-five or seven a couple of days in a row, I'm like, oh, someone's a little stressed kind of thing. Um, so I have these like really clear indicators um of that. It's like led me to a place where I'm just like crazy from a sleep perspective. Like I have an aura ring and a eight sleep mattress that hurt crucial now to kind of operating and um from a routine perspective i think we spoke about this but like try to work out every morning which happens maybe 60 70 percent of the time um and then i'll go like two weeks without doing anything like okay i need to like almost reset and force myself to just get into the gym for 10 minutes just to like kind of get back in um so i think just listening is the easiest thing that maybe a lot of founders and just operators out there could do uh almost like listening to your body and listening to your habits um mm. i think we joked before like if you see my like chess games if there's like more than 10 a day like there's like 20 or 30 a day like i'm clearly stressed because i'm avoiding what i don't want to do by just playing chess online yeah um, so it's funny to like almost listen and hear and then okay take a step back um my wife also is very good at just being like oh someone's stressed i'm like how do you know that she's like you just seem off kind of thing. So definitely having those feedback loops are super important, at least to the, me to like the know chess when thing is an interesting that. loop, though, isn't it? Uh, because I actually experienced that myself here. I was traveling. I just got back from Nashville. Uh, we were visiting some clients. Uh, I found out that I don't play chess very well when I'm traveling on an airplane. I don't know why, but it was you know one of those moments where you're just like, boy, every move I made, I was like, that was a dumb move. <laughs> that one's going to cost me pretty yeah. bad. And uh, yeah, like you said, there's just those different indicators. Um, what I want to I want to get into some fun questions, but before we get into like just like some random fun questions here for for everybody, um, what's the what's the one piece of advice that you would give if you were going to give this to anybody that's either let's say starting down their entrepreneurial journey or or partway into it and and they're they're just looking for some advice if you were running into you or if somebody could run into you and give you this advice, what's that piece of advice you feel like is like at the top of your list? Yeah, I think for us. Like anecdotally, we've spoken a, a ton about it. The thing that I always harp on on the software side of things is just understanding when things are going well and understand when things aren't. You know what I mean? And yeah. being able to almost reset certain things um, is, I think, super important <laughs> as far as kind of business, mm-hmm. whether it's continuity or product market fit, whatever those things are. So that's often what I would what I express through our kind of journey of scaling this company of knowing what product market fit doesn't feel like and knowing what it does feel like. Um, and you could, you, I think funny enough, when we pivoted, like one of my other founder friends just laughed because like, of course, like who, who doesn't essentially, um, like how oftentimes is your first idea, the actual idea. Um, so just kind of listening to the, listening to customers in the market, I think is the biggest piece of advice that I would, what I would give people and just like understanding the size of the market and the economics around it is something I think I wish I did a little bit more uh, previous to fairing in the same day world. It's just like understanding that a little bit more would have definitely helped us. But fair enough from a serendipity standpoint, like we almost had to fail to get to a place where we are now. So when I, I think interestingly enough, that's literally what your company does then too. Like you are doing the ability to assess for people like what's working, what's not working. What's so I working. think that's, yeah. that's interesting that that's just even where your whole mindset, mindset uh, goes. Okay, a couple of fun questions, completely random. Uh, these ones you have, you know, no prep for whatsoever, uh, but sometimes that's the most fun. Uh, and maybe these will be dead, so let's see. Um, what do most people not know about you? Is there a quirk or a strange habit or a hobby or something you're like, you know what, most people don't know me, but if, if you, we were in the office with you in New York City, you're like, you would probably see that I'm the guy who types really loudly, whatever this might be. Um. I don't recall if I shared anything with you. As far as in the office, I think I am uh, the fastest typer in the office. I played piano for about 15 years, which I think helped type. Um, so 
I know me and a couple engineers went through like a typing test about two months ago and I was happily at like, I think 107 or 115 was my nice. words per minute, which was kind of fun. Um, so that's probably the, like, there's nothing, I feel like I'm a pretty normal person to sit next to during the day um, yeah. in the office. Okay. Um, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Is there something you've done that you're like, you know, I jumped onto a train uh, off of a bridge. Yeah, I think the I used to be a, a little bit crazier. I've had like I think six now dislocated shoulders, at least from a thing. So I definitely was crazy like in some like bowls in Colorado when I was in my early twenties, kind of thing, which is probably a little bit daunting now that I wouldn't even go close to a couple sure. of surgeries later. Um, so that's probably the craziest thing. Uh, but I'm definitely I think those hurting yourself a couple times definitely resets certain things. Uh, as far as being crazy, unless you're one of these people that just continues to lean into that. Um, but definitely on the skiing side, uh, I, I snowboarded for like six years too. definitely just doing some, what one might say is like irresponsible things at high rates of speed, um, which at the time was a ton of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Six dislocated shoulders. That's gotta be uh, getting up there as far as records go. I don't know if I know anybody else personally that's dislocated their shoulder that many times. So Do you, like, um, pick a sport, like, skiing uh wakeboarding <laughs> snowboarding skateboarding uh were the four i did it each one um so yeah i'm a little bit slower these days so i i played a lot of sports played basketball baseball uh taekwondo and i surprisingly didn't get that injured in most of the sports that i played uh you know twisted ankles things like that but nothing radical um one of the worst injuries though that i got uh, was on a pogo stick of all things, um, because I just like to take anything to the extreme. And so I, uh, there was a loading dock, uh, there, uh, in Ohio, uh, like a semi loading dock, right. For or whatever. Uh, so I tried to do a backflip off of the loading dock on a pogo stick Jesus. and it didn't quite go the way that I wanted it to. Um, but it's, that's not as good of a story to tell. It was like, uh, it's just, you know, that's pretty great. thing that it did. It's pretty that's dumb. Pretty <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? When you were a kid, what were you like? This is what I want to be. I want to be a, an astronaut, a president. Yeah, I also uh, I mentioned I played piano. I played guitar as well. And like, I think until the age of 22, I was convinced I was going to play guitar for a living. Um, so that was definitely it. Like I went to a ton of solo concerts in high school. Like, um, just like I remember, funny enough, like John Mayer at the time. I feel like no one, no one knew how good of a guitar player he was. Um, and I remember I grew up in like central, oh, it's incredible. I, I grew up in central Connecticut, uh, and bought a ticket, like two hours, but a solo one person ticket when I was like 17 to see him at the Meadows. I think it's, it's called something else now. And I was like third row. Cause it was, I don't know, it was like a hundred dollars too. Um, cause like, that's who I was looking up to. Like I still look up to great guitar players and try to go to a ton of, ton of concerts, but that was definitely what I thought I was going to be. And I almost, uh, I toured Berkeley and Boston because I was going to kind of switch schools um, and try to lean into that. And then, frankly, I just never, never committed or maybe it was lack of confidence in myself or whatnot. But I did clearly don't regret it. I still play music. Um, but that's definitely what I thought I was going to do when I grew up. So what style of uh, guitar did you play? I mean, uh, it was all blue. It was all blues. OK. For the most part. Yeah. Blues. Stuff. But I grew up. I'm like a trained classical pianist, dare I say that. Um, so good things in the bad. I could sound very good if we're talking about Beethoven or Bach or Mozart. Ooh. But if you throw me into like a jam band on the keys, I won't be able to do much. Uh, but on a guitar, I definitely could. Just this morning, I was listening to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, Second Movement, one of my absolute favorites. And I don't know why, but that's one of the songs we're talking about. Like, it moves me in ways where it's like, OK, I'm ready to get. And it, for those who don't know it, it's, it's like, bum, 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 bum. And it's just, I don't know, like, for some reason, it's like, you got to listen to this. It's like, the buildup is just incredible on that. But one of my favorite songs. Yeah. So you mentioned this. What was your favorite song to play on the piano? Or is? Oh. Now, now it's Piano Man with a harmonica around my neck because yeah, thinks it's, thinks it's hilarious. Um, so we'll go with that. Like I feel like what I play now is like frankly a ton of Billy Joel and Elton John, just because people are typically around and it's a lot of fun. Um, it's like the yeah. music I like. Um, so we'll go with that. I love it. 
Okay. It, is there one product that you could not live without? This didn't exist. And, and we'll say like, you know, not necessarily like, a, well, let, let's get rid of the phone. Phone not being it, because I feel like everybody feels that way about a phone. Is there another thing that you're like, this, I use this on a daily basis and I would be pretty bummed if this didn't exist. Yeah, I feel like this is kind of a layup and I mentioned it before, but like we have a, a cooling mattress, frankly, and like I sleep hot. And like I woke up this morning, I told my wife because it's starting to get hot here in New York. And I was just like, it is this is why we have the mattress. I just woke up so refreshed. Um I know there's a ton of big big advocates for the eight sleep mattress, but that's probably the thing that I well, like right now. I'm like, I hopefully will have one of these forever. Um we we need good sleep. It's important. Yeah. It I realized that my not to go into the sleep thing, but I realized that I was getting all this brain fog uh at like two or three o'clock and it was solely related to bad sleep like this is kind of when i started to analyze those things a little bit more and realize what was happening yeah do you have that the aura ring did we talk about that i do have an aura ring <laughs> i know that's i somebody who likes data probably has an aura ring and, and is tracking that stuff i love that uh or yeah. if you'd like to sponsor the next episode uh no <laughs> okay um the last uh, one that I have for you then is uh, a segment that I'm going to call What's That Mean? Uh, where I'm going to give you an absolutely ridiculous word. It is a real word in the English language. And I want you to just make up a definition for it uh, that you think we will find believable. So the word is Argle Bargle. It's A-R-G-L-E hyphen B-A-R-G-L-E. What does Argle Bargle mean? Argle bargle is when you're trying to talk, uh, but you have water in your mouth or liquid in your mouth. <laughs> um, and the actual name of the sound of talking with the water in your mouth is argle bargle. Ooh, that's actually, warble. that's a common word. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 That's actually probably not that far off from the real definition. Uh, <laughs> it was something with talking. I don't remember what it was, but it's just like talking oh, really? I think, yeah. in gibberish or whatever. Um, that's funny. Okay. Uh, Matt, I'm so thankful that you came on here to share your time with us, share your expertise with us. If people wanted to reach out to you and uh, let's say, you know, follow you or ask questions or follow up with you, where's the best place that we could send them? Yeah, you could follow me on LinkedIn. You could just search my name or Twitter's Matt R. Barr. Um, I mean, email Matt at Faring .co. There's a ton of ways to, to reach out. Um, but yeah, happy to chat anything that we spoke about, attribution, commerce, et cetera. Um, always happy to engage with more people, create more serendipity. And to clarify, uh, if you're listening and not watching, that's B-A-H-R bar. So if you're looking that up, make sure you spell that correctly. Um, Matt, thank you again for coming out and joining us. Thanks so much. This was a ton of fun. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.